So today I will talk about obstruction for this three color H3 graph. This is a joint work with Maria Chernovsky, Jan Gorgiber, and Oliver Schurz. So you all know what a K color is, just deciding whether a graph can be colored within K colors. And it's well known that it can be complete for any K greater than or equal to three. So a relevant definition people are interested in is a critical graph. So a graph is k plus one critical if it's not k colorable, but this every subgraph is k colorable. Which means that if we delete an edge or a vertex, the graph will become k colorable. So similar definition is k plus one vertex critical. So instead of requiring the every subgraph, we require every induced subgraph. Which means that if we have a k plus one vertex critical graph, and we delete any vertex, then the graph becomes k colorable. So it is obvious that a k plus one critical graph is also a k plus one vertex critical graph. So here is a small example for critical graph, it's just k4. So because of the np completeness, we cannot hope to find all k critical graph. So we are thinking of focus of the critical graph on a small family. So specifically, we are interested in H3 graph, which has been discussed many times today, so I'm not bothered with definition. And it turns out, if, even if we forbid some graph edge, it might not be so helpful if edge is cycle or something. So it will only be helpful if that edge is a subgraph or path. So specifically, we want to forbid some PT, which means that a coordinate graph on T vertices. So there are some positive results. Uh, due to Bruce, Huang, and Sawanda, they are exactly six for critical P5 free graph. So if you forbid them P5, the four critical graph, only six of them. And due to Mafia, Mura, and if we forbid them P5, they are exactly 12 for what has a critical graph. So they are still not so much. But on the negative side, they also show that there are infinite many of k critical p5 free graph when k greater than or equal to five. So what they prove is that they actually construct an infinite family of k vertex critical p5 free graph. And they also show that if there is an infinite number of k vertex critical graph, there's also an infinite number of k critical graph. So the two definitions is more or less the same if you do not care about the real numbers. So one remark is that k coloring p5 free graph is actually a polynomial softball. So, it's, so a polynomial softball is not sufficient to, to for finitely of k critical graph. So last year we were able to show that for any connected edge, so the four vertex critical graph is finite if and only if edge is a subgraph of p6. So we are trying to extend this result in two directions. The first direction is obvious is to get rid of this connective, connected. So another direction is we will try to generalize the idea of three coloring. So for three coloring, you can think of every vertex can be colored either two, one, two, or three. But what if that's not the case? So you may think of some vertex are only allowed to color one, two, and some vertex are only allowed to color two, three. So this comes to the next definition. Oh, I forgot to mention that the exact 24, P63, for critical graph and 80 vertex critical graph. So that comes to the next definition of least coloring. So for least coloring, we are giving a graph G and the function L such that L means that the, the all variable colors of each vertex. So for three coloring, we can think of every L, LV equals one, two, three for any V. So because we are interested in three coloring, so in this talk, we think of LV is a subset of one, two, three. So actually that's something more general than three coloring. So now similar to the concept of vertex critical graph, we introduce the concept of minimal least obstruction. So we call a pair GL a minimal least obstruction if GL is not colorable, but for all induced purple subgraph, then it's colorable. 
which means that if we delete any vertex of G, then the graph is callable. So here is an example of minimal least subtraction. So it's only a P3. If there's no least, that's too callable. But if you add this, you can see that it's not callable. And if we delete any vertex, that's still callable anymore. So use this new definition, we're able to pull our main results. The first result is that there are only finitely many of edge-free minimal list subtraction if and only if edge is an induced subgraph of P6 or P4 plus some vertex. The next result is to get rid of the connect of the edge. So there are only finitely many edge-free full vertex critical graph if and only if edge is an induced subgraph of P6 to P3 and P4 plus some vertex. So this is our two main results. And please note that the two P3 only appear in the case where it's for critical graph. So today, uh, we will show that there are finite many P6 free minimal this obstruction. So to an we analyze, we basically separate into two cases. So the first case is obstruction with least of size at most two. So assume that we have a minimal least obstruction, and the least is at most two, at most two for any vertex in that graph. So we pick arbitrary vertex, and we assume the least is one two. So first observation is that if at one is in x least, there must be exist some vertex x one who is a gen two x, and he has one in his list. Because if that's not the case, then we delete the x, then we ca can color everything else by definition of minimal obstruction. And then we can give x the color one, we'll make the whole graph ca colorable. So that's a contradiction. So we must find some vertex x1 in x neighbor such that one is in x1's list. So remember that the list of x1 is at most two, and one is one of them. So once we give x the color one, so the coloring of x1 is somehow forced. So we can continue such process until we find a conflict edge. So here is an example. If we give this vertex color 1, the next must be color 3, and the next 2, and 3, and 2, and so on. So the last is a crossing edge, but before the crossing edge, there may be some other edge. So one observation is that if you call this P1 by start with X color 1, we can find P2 similarly, and we claim that there is nothing else. So the whole graph is really P1 plus P2, because P1 plus P2 is enough to make the graph not couple. So using this observation, we were able to so we, we try to, so, at, so it's easy to see that as long as we can bound P1, then we can give a bound of the whole graph. So we use that, we define something like pro propagating paths. So a path from V1 to Vk is a propagating path. So the first vertex has this at most one, and the rest has this exact two. So the second requirement is that once we give V1 the color alpha 1, then we can somehow force the color along the path, which means that for color for v, VI, the color is alpha i. And there's no conflict edge. So the third requirement is a little bit stronger. So for any edge that is uh, not from adjacent vertices, so we require that it only has a form such as one is one, two, and another is two, three. So it's somehow a strong requirement on the edge. So you may notice that for the P1 defined in the earlier slide, if we do not count the last vertex, then condition one and the two satisfied, it's just give a color in, then the color is forced. But the last condition does not necessarily hold. But we can show that as long as we can bound the, the lines of propagating paths, we can bound the lines the size of the whole graph. So I will give you some idea of to prove that. 
but I'm not going to too detail on it. So we pick a vertex V such that the path P1 and P2 defined earlier satisfy that the maximum of P1 and P2 is minimal. So we let P1 is a path from V1 to V. S, and we let the conflict edge be to be VR, VS. So it's something like this. We start from V1, then the color is somehow forced until VR. So one observation is that instead of, instead of forcing the color from V1 to VR, we can go the other direction. We can, we can force the color from V1 to VS, then we force the color of VR because that's a conflict edge, so we can go to Vs to Vr, then we go back to Vs plus one. So basically, these are two candidates of the P1. So since we are choosing somehow the P1 is minimal, we may assume that there is no shortcut somehow between this, in this area in both directions, which means that there's no shortcut from Vs to Vr, and there's no, short, uh, there's no shortcut from Vr going back to Vs plus one. So we consider an edge VIVJ, which is some edge which is not from the adjacent vertices, but it's some, somewhere between VS and VR. So we assume the least of the first vertex 1, 2. So because that's not a conflict edge, because we assume the VR, VS is the first conflict edge, we know the least of VJ is not 1 something, because that's a conflict. We assume that the first is the color he must force. The second is that the VJ is not something one, because if something one, then the edge VI, VJ is a shortcut. So we can directly go to VI and to VJ and then to VR, which gives a shorter path than P1. So that's a contradiction. So we can assume that VJ is not 3, 2, because that will be a shortcut if we're going backwards. So the last possible case is that the VJS list is 2, 3. So which means that if we have some edge that's not from the adjacent vertices, it must have the shape of 1, 2, and 2, 3. So this is actually the requirement of our propagating path. So it means that the path from Vs to Vr minus 1 is a propagating path. So we could also show that from V1 to Vs minus 1, that's our propagating path, use a similar idea. So this gives the proof of the previous lemma, which means that as long as we can bound the propagating path, we can bound the whole graph. So use computer search, you were able to find that if G is P63, there are the every propagating path has the most 24 vertices. And one remark is that this bound can be also be achieved by hand, but I mean, we will give a much larger bound and the analyze complicated, so I'm not going to Describe that. So, as we have this result, we could bound the list subtraction in which every list has size at most two. So, the remaining case is to reduce the list to at most two. So, to do that, we need some tools. So, the first tool is uh, pre coloring. So, assume we have GL, which is a minimal list subtraction. We let R be some induced subgraph of G, and we assume that there are finitely many of possible coloring of R. And if we pick one of the pre-coloring of R, we can some the minimal need subtraction induced by that is somehow bounded by some K. So if the two conditions satisfied, then we can bound G. So the statement that my tedious, so I just use some picture to show what does that mean. So assume we have big graph G. We have some small bounded side graph, which is triangle, that's R. So we can give some finite many of coloring of this triangle. So first we assume it color like this. And if once we give it the color, so the least is change, and we can find some minimal subtraction. Some, somehow smaller. We assume this blue one is the minimal subtraction we found given the pre-color of this triangle. So we can try other coloring of the triangle. Let's say we color this way, 
and we find another small minimal section, and the third way and another. So we assume these three ways are the only possible ways of pre-color this triangle. Then we claim that the whole graph is just this triangle plus these three things together, because these three things together is enough to make the graph not colorable. So there's really nothing else. So this number, so the idea of this number is pretty simple, but it gives us a tool that we can pre-color a bounded structure in the graph, which helps us reduce the list. So the, another tool we want to use is the update. So what is update? So we assume that the vertex whose list is one, and he has some neighbor, he's one, two, and one, three here. So because he's one, we know that this vertex cannot actually be called one. So he can must be two and he can must be three. So we remove one from his list. So this procedure we call it update. So next we have a list obstruction, not necessarily minimal. We we have a set X is who has this set one, means that his color is first. So we update with respect, to, with respect to x only once, and we get the list L crime. Remember, then we will remove, we will change the list of neighborhood of x. So we assume we find the minimal list obstruction induced by the new list L crime. So then there exists a minimal list obstruction by the, by the original list, which is bounded by four times the list obstruction induced by the new list. So again, I use some picture to show the idea of the lemma. So assume we have x and we have neighbor of x. So we pre-color, uh, we update the, the list of x to n of x. And now we find some this minimal list obstruction in the new list air crime. So there is a vertex here. Assume his list is 2, 3 in the new list. But his list may be, say, one, two, three in the previous list, which means that this red cycle is not a minimal list subtraction in the original list because now his list changed. So what do we do? We track back to, to see this guy's neighbor. So as his list is reduced by, by one, he must have neighbor whose list is one. So we enlarge the minimal structure to include the guys up we backtrack. So that's how we bound a minimal obstruction in the original list. So one remark is that this procedure can be extended to update a bounded number of time. So here is the general idea of reducing the list. So we use one structure theorem if any connected PT free graph contains a connected dominant set, which is either PT minus two three or PT minus two. So a dominating set is a set such that every, every other vertex is adjacent to such set. So our first case is contain a dominating P4, so which means that every other vertex is adjacent to this P4. So by the previous tool, we can pre-color this P4, and we can update with respect to that P4 then every list is reduced to at most two. Then we are done by the, our first case. So the second case is assume it contains dominating P6 free graph. So then we can partition it to be A and B such that A is complete to B. So it is solvable assume that there's no C5. So the last case is a start with C5 and we pre-color the C5 and we update and we do some very complicated tool and then eventually we are able to reduce the elements of these to at most two. So, we, so that's basically the idea of our proof. So using a similar strategy, we can prove that there are finitely many P4 plus K some, plus some singletons and finitely many two P3 free for critical graph. And there exists an infinite family of P7 free for critical graph 2P1 plus P, 2P2 plus P1 free for critical graph and the infinite family of 2P3 free this obstruction. So now we can, if we put all these pieces together, 
we have put our main two main theorem. So what's next? So the next step we may consider when we instead of forbidden one graph, we may want to forbidden two graph, which is H1, H2, three critical graph and least obstruction. So it turns out that if we forbidden two graph, then the critical graph could, could be very simple. For example, if you forbid P6 and C3, there is only one for critical graph. And as you may recall, if we forbid the P5, then any k critical graph is infinite for any k greater than equal to 5. But if we forbid the case P6, which is stronger, if we add another C4, then there are infinite, there are finitely many k critical P6 C4 free graph. So that may be the next step we will consider. So that's the end of my talk, and thanks for your attention.